Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 20. In this part, I'm going to show you using integral calculus why spheres of uniform density can be considered point masses. I want to start with some basic calculus and show you how I can use integral calculus to determine the area of a circle. There are two basic methods for computing areas, shell and disk integration. So I'll start with shell integration. Here's the circle with radius r. The, cir the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r. Then I'll create an inner band, which I'll call a shell. And the outer radius is going to be t. The circumference of the outer radius is 2 pi t. And the width of the shell is dt, which means I want the width to be infinitesimally small. The area of this yellow band is approximately 2 pi t times dt, which isn't the exact area because the inner radius is smaller than 2 pi t. However, if I take the limit as dt approaches 0, then 2 pi t approaches the area, I'm sorry, 2 pi t dt approaches the area of this infinitesimally small band. Here's the formula expressed as an integral. This is the integral from 0 to r of 2 pi t dt. Geometrically, that means that I'll compute the area of thin bands of um, circles from 0 to r. And then as I add these up, add up these infinitesimally narrow rings, I'll end up with the area of a circle. I need to determine the antiderivative of 2 pi t dt to resolve the integral. 2 pi is a constant, so I can move that outside the integral. The derivative of t squared is 2t, and I know that from calculus. So I can express that this way. Um, I can move the dt over to the other side of this equation and then divide both sides by 2. So uh, dt squared over 2 is t dt. So the antiderivative of t is t squared over 2. And I will make that substitution here. Now I'm evaluating t squared over 2 um, from 0 to r, and then multiplying the result by 2 pi. That equals 2 pi times r squared over 2 minus 0 squared over 2, and that equals 2 pi r squared over 2, which equals pi r squared, which, as you probably know, is the formula for the area of a circle. The disk method works this way. I'll start with a circle of radius r. I'll then define a wedge defined by angle d theta, which should look familiar from my part on Kepler's second law. If this wedge were a triangle, the area would be 1 half base times height. And I assert that equals 1 half r d theta. Intuitively, that seems wrong. When I talked about Kepler's second law, the area of a wedge was 1 half r squared sine d theta. In this case, d theta is an arc that's going to get infinitesimally small. So it's not exactly the height, but as d theta converges to 0, uh, it equals the height. Um, so this kind of a cheat works in calculus. So now the formula for the area equals the integral from 0 to 2 pi r times 1 half r d theta. Geometrically, that means I'll compute the area of thin wedges from 0 to 2 pi r. There's a circumference of the circle. Here the antiderivative is simple since I'm integrating over d theta, and since there's no theta in the equation, um, 1 half r is a constant. So I simply evaluate 1 half r from 0 to 2 pi r. And that equals 1 half r times 2 pi r minus 1 half r times 0. And that equals 1 half 2 times 2 pi r, which equals pi r squared. Um, so previously, when I estimated the area of a wedge um, of a circle, I did so by multiplying the area of the circle times the angle of the theta in this case, 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle. And so that would equal 2 pi r squared d theta over 2 pi r, which equals 1 half r d theta. So given that the area of the circle is pi r squared, the area of the wedge is, the area of the wedge is indeed 1 half r d theta. Here's an alternate way to derive the area of a circle. I'll start with the equation for a circle in rectangular coordinates. I'll then express that in terms of y. The area is this integral. I'm only taking the positive portion of the equation for y, which is a semicircle. So in the integral, I have to double it. I've already derived the formula for the area of a circle twice, so I won't do that again. Um, what's important to know here, however, is that this integral results in the formula pi times a squared. 
Here's the derivation for the area of an ellipse. This is the equation of rectangular coordinates for an ellipse. I can express that in terms of y squared and then in terms of y. I can simplify this a bit. Here I'm changing uh, 1 to a squared over a squared so that the terms under the radical can be over a common denominator. And that reduces this. And then I'll move b squared over a squared out from under the radical. And so the integral for the area of an ellipse is this. b over a is constant, so that can come outside the integral. And then notice that I'm left with the integral for the area of a circle, and I already know what that is. So the area of an ellipse is b over, z, b over a times pi a squared. And then one of the a's in the numerator cancels with one of the denominator, and I'm left with um, a b pi, which is the formula for the area of an ellipse. I can use integrals to compute any arbitrary arc length. Um, this employs a common method. So let's say I've got points plotted along some curve, like what's depicted here. It starts at s sub a and ends at s sub b. And I want to compute the length of the line segment along the curve from s a to s b. So I can estimate the distance between the first and second points this way, which is ex not exact, but it's close. This is the x component. This is the y component. And from the Pythagorean theorem, I know that delta s squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared. So if I make delta s smaller and smaller, I get ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared. Smaller and smaller intervals eventually converge on the exact arc length. So I'm showing this as an equality. ds is the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. And I want to rearrange some terms. So I'm going to multiply this by dx squared over dx squared. I'm going to put uh, the two terms in the parentheses over a common denominator, dx squared. And then dx squared over dx squared is 1. So I'll make that reduction. And then I can move the dx squared um, outside the radical as dx. And now I have a formula for ds that's expressed in terms of dx. So if I want to know the arc length, I'd compute it with this integral. It's the integral from a to b um, of the function uh, ds. So this is a general formula that sets up an integral for any function dy dx. Um, I now want to look at a specific example, which is a circle. So here's a circle. Here's the formula for a circle. Um, I need a formula in terms of y. So y equals plus or minus 1 minus x squared. Um, the plus part defines the semicircle above the x-axis, and the y minus part is below the x-axis. So I want to consider the part above the x-axis. And um, let's consider an arc where x goes from 0 to a. And in order to use our general equation for arc length, I'm going to need to express the formula for y as a derivative dy dx. The antiderivative of the square root of 1 minus x squared is minus x over the square root of 1 minus x squared, um, which if you study calculus, um, you'd know this to be the case. And here again is the formula for ds. And then I plug in the formula for um, dy dx. And if I square minus x over the square root of 1 minus x squared, I get x squared over 1 minus x squared. And then I put uh, both terms under the, under the radical under a common denominator. And now I can add the two terms together. And notice that we have a minus x squared and a plus x squared in the numerator, which will cancel. That simplifies to this. And I can simplify that further. And then I'll define alpha as the arc length that I'm trying to com compute. The formula for alpha is this integral. It's the integral from 0 to a of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. The antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx is the inverse sine of x. And I'll evaluate that from 0 to a. And that's pretty simple because um, the inverse sine of 0 is 0. And so the formula for the integral ends up being the inverse sine of z. If alpha is the inverse sine of a, then sine of alpha is a. And this ends up being the formal definition of radians. And it means that for a given angle alpha, the arc length is alpha radians, where one radian is an arc length equal to um, the radius a.
um, and 2 pi radians equals one full revolution. Here I'll compute the surface area of a circle with radius r. I'm going to start with a semicircle that's defined by y squared plus x squared equals r squared, and I'll solve for y. For a circle, it equals plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared, but I'm going to limit this to positive y values, so it'll be a semicircle. Um, so ds, the arc length, is the square root of 1 minus dy dx um, squared dx. dy dx is d dx times the square root of r squared minus x squared, which equals minus x over the square root of r squared minus x squared. And I can substitute that for dy dx. Um, so here I substitute minus x over the square root of r squared minus x squared for dy dx. And that results in the square root of r squared over r squared minus x squared dx. And that's the formula for arc length. To compute the surface area, I want to rotate this by 2 pi radians. The integral is 2 pi y ds. The 2 pi implies that I'm making a full rotation. And by using y, I'm implying the rotation is about the x-axis. So the semicircle is going to do a full rotisserie rotation about the x-axis. And the ds implies that I'm rotating an arc. I can substitute the square root of r squared minus x squared for y and the square root of r squared over r squared minus x squared dx for ds. The square root of r squared minus x squared term is in the numerator and denominator, so those cancel. And I'm left with the integral of 2 pi um, times the square root of r squared dx. And that equals the integral of 2 pi r dx. So I want this to be in the range from minus r to r. And now I'm going to take the semicircle and rotate it 2 pi radians about, um, this is the 2 pi radian rotation about the x-axis. 2 pi r is a constant, so I simply evaluate um, r from minus r to r. And that equals 2 pi r times minus r minus minus r. And that's uh, 2 pi r times 2 r, and that equals 4 pi r squared, which is the formula for the surface area of a circle. And so here I'm going to compute the volume of a sphere. This uses uh, the disk method. Imagine a disk with radius pi y squared um, and a thickness of dx. The volume of this disk would be pi y squared dx. And in order to integrate this, I need this to be a function of x. I can use the Pythagorean theorem to derive a substitution for y. And in fact, I'll use 1 for y squared. And I'll make that substitution here. Here's the integral form from minus r to r. I can bring pi outside the integral. r squared is a constant. And the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. And that ends up being pi times r cubed minus r cubed over 3 minus pi times minus r cubed plus r cubed over 3. And that is pi 2r cubed over 3 minus pi times minus 2r cubed over 3. And that equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. The volume is also the integral of the surface area of the circle. Here I take that from 0 to r. The volume is computed by, here by starting with an infinitesimally small sphere and expanding it out to a sphere with radius r. And I just computed the formula for the volume 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that the derivative of, of the integral is the underlying function. So the antiderivative of 4 thirds pi r cubed is 4 pi r squared. And that's the formula for the surface area of a sphere. And I'm not going to delve into this into detail, but um, you could do these uh, integrals as double or triple integrals. OK, now I'll show you how Newton was able to prove that the gravitational effect of a um, spherical mass with uniform density is the same as if it were a point mass. Um, he did this with his newly developed integral calculus. Um, if the mass is not evenly distributed, the gravitational effect would come from its center of mass. And so you'd have to do some computation to figure out where that was. 
Um, perfect spheres the uniform densities make the math simpler, which makes explaining the concept simpler. In real life, there are no perfect spheres um, with uniform density. Um, so for the sake of explanation, I'll assume the simpler case. Newton proved that a point mass is equivalent to a uniformly massive sphere by showing that a thin spherical shell is equivalent to a solid sphere. So imagine a spherical mass is layer, a layered combination of concentric spherical shells. If I prove that a spherical shell from an outsider's point of view is identical to a point mass, then it follows that layers of such shell, shells all taken together are also identical to a point mass. So the proof that Newton derived is called the shell theorem. And it's derived by showing that the sum of infinitesimally um, thin rings with infinitesimally small depth of the surface of a sphere adds up to the volume of an infinitesimally thin shell. So this animation shows how I'm going to uh, set up this integral to determine the gravitational force created by a very thin shell. And I'll do it by computing the force exerted by a series of thin bands um, that represent a cross-section of the shell. Okay, I need the law of cosines for this derivation. Um, uh, here I'll determine the length of the side of a non-right triangle if I know the lengths of the other two sides and the angle between them. Um, I'm not going to use it that way for this derivation, um, and I'll, I'll show you what I need this for in a minute. So here I start with a triangle that's not a right triangle with an interior angle theta. Here I'll put a point C at the origin, and I'll call this length of this base A. And the coordinate for this point B is A0. And I'll call the length of this side C and this B. Okay, I want to drop a perpendicular down from point A to the x-axis. So this distance is A minus B cosine theta. It's the x component of the side B, and since it goes from right to left, it, it, it's a negative value. The length of this perpendicular line segment is B sine theta. The coordinates for this point A is minus B cosine theta, um, B sine theta. Those are the xy coordinates. And then this entire length is then A minus B cosine theta. The Pythagorean theorem tells us that for a right triangle, the hypotenuse squared equals the sum of the squares of the two sides. The purple triangle is a right triangle. See the hypotenuse squared equals a minus b cosine theta squared plus b sine theta squared. I can expand the a minus b cosine theta squared. It equals a squared minus 2ab cosine theta plus b squared cosine th squared theta. I can factor out b squared in the last two terms. Cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1, so that effectively cancels out. And that leaves us with a squared minus 2ab cosine theta plus b squared. And I can reorder that, and this is the cosine law. I can derive the length of side C by knowing the lengths of the sides A and B and the angle theta. In the derivation of the shell theorem, I'm going to need the derivative of the cosine law. So the derivative of the cosine law with respect to C is expressed this way. I can express the derivatives this way. The derivative of a sum of terms is the sum of their individual derivative. The derivative of c squared is 2c. The derivative of a squared is um, b squared with respect to c is 0. And with respect to c, a and b are constants, so their derivatives are 0. So the derivative of 2ab cosine theta is 2ab sine theta. And because theta is a function within the cosine function, the chain rule tells us I have to add d theta. Now I'll set up Newton's proof geometrically. Imagine this is our spherical shell of infinitesimal width. Here I'll say the mass of the spherical shell is m. I'll call the radius of the sphere r. And here I'll put a test mass p out here. The distance from the test mass to the center is little r. This line is coincident with the x-axis. And now I'll define a ring. And the angle formed by P, the center of the sphere, to the ring is theta. In fact, I can define the ring as all points on the sphere where this angle equals theta. And so I'd essentially sweep that R line around in a uh, circle. I'll call the distance from the ring to the test mass P um, S. 
this is right there. And then I'll give the ring an infinitesimal width, d theta. In integral calculus, this will approach zero. Here I'll call the mass of the ring dm. The mass dm exerts a gravitational force on p. And the superposition principle tells us that because the mass is uniformly distributed in a ring, it's equidistant at all point p. And so the net force is along the x-axis. I'll call the angle from the ring to p to the center of the sphere alpha. And if I drop a perpendicular line from the ring down to the x-axis, this forms a right triangle with a line segment S as the hypotenuse. The x component is S cosine alpha, and per the superposition principle, the gravitational force exerted on P by the ring is effectively a distance of S cosine alpha away. The gravitational force of the ring exerted on P is minus G times the mass of the ring dm over the distance S squared times the cosine of alpha. The area of the ring is its circumference times its width, and the circumference is two times the radius. The perpendicular line I just drew is the radius of the ring. The hypotenuse of the triangle that includes the angle theta is the radius, capital R, the radius of the sphere. And the radius of the ring, the red dashed line, is the side opposite theta, so its length is R sine theta. The circumference of the ring is 2 pi r sine theta. The ring has width, so it isn't the exact circumference. And again, the beauty of calculus is that I don't have to worry about that. When I take the limit, um, the circumference of the inner and the outer part of the ring will converge on the same value. So here I'll give the ring a width. The arc um, from the x-axis of the ring is r times theta. That would be our starting point for width. And here I'll call the angle formed by the width of the ring d theta. It's an infinitesimally small angle that extends just beyond theta. The arc length of the ring is then r d theta. And that means that the surface area of the ring is 2 pi r sine theta times r d theta. I computed this area as if the ring um, was a rectangle. While it isn't exactly correct, when I take the limit, it will converge to the right value. So the total surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. The ratio of the surface area of the ring to the total area is 2 pi r sine theta r d theta over 4 pi r squared. I'll use this ratio to determine the mass of the ring. The total mass of the sphere is capital M. So the mass of the ring is that ratio times the total mass of the sphere. I can simplify this equation. There's a 2 in the numerator and a 4 in the denominator. That reduces the 2 in the denominator. And there's a pi in both the numerator and denominator. And there's two r's in the numerator and an r squared in the denominator. This equation simplifies to m over 2 times sine theta d theta. I can make that substitution in our equation for dgx. Here I'll express gm over 2 in one fraction and then put cosine alpha over s squared next followed by sine theta d theta. The law of cosines, which I derived earlier, tells us that r squared equals little r squared plus s squared minus 2rs cosine alpha. I can express that as cosine alpha equals r squared plus s squared minus big R squared over 2rs. I can make that substitution in the equation for gd sub x. And, can I sim and I can simplify that by moving 2rs into the no 2rs into the denominator. Since there was already an s squared in the denominator, that becomes 2rs cubed. The law of cosines tells us that s squared equals big R squared plus R squared minus um, 2 R little r cosine theta. And the derivative of that equation, which I derived on the previous slide, is S dS equals R R sine theta d theta. I can express this in terms of sine theta d theta. That equals S dS over big R times little r. And now here I'll substitute S dS over R R for sine theta d theta. If I rearrange terms and cancel one of the um, s's in the denominator, I get this, and I can express that equation this way. I changed s squared over s squared to 1 and left r squared minus big R squared um, over s squared. Now I'll integrate, now I'll integrate from s equals r minus big R to r plus big R. That's from this point here to this point here. Um, the first point is a distance r minus big R away from P. The second point is r plus big R away from P. 
minus gm over 4rr squared is a constant. That can come out of the integral. The integral of 1 ds is s. And the integral of a constant r squared minus big R squared over s squared is minus the constant over s. And I'll evaluate this from uh, r plus big R to r minus big R. That becomes this equation. Notice the r squared minus big R squared in the first and second terms. I can factor those into r minus big R times r plus big R. In the first term, r minus big R is in the numerator and the denominator of the fraction. Likewise, in the second term, r plus big R is in the numerator and the denominator of the fraction. So those will cancel out. And I'm left with minus gm over 4 r r squared times r plus big R minus r minus big R minus r minus big R plus r uh, plus r plus big R. If I do the first few additions and subtractions, I get 2 times big R minus 2 times big R. And that results in minus gm over 4 r r squared times 4 times big R. And I end up with minus gm over r squared. That's the same force equation for a point mass. So this is how Newton proved that if you're outside a spherical shell of mass m, the force equation is the same as if all the mass was located at a point at the center of the sphere. From that, he inferred that the same would be true for a set of concentric shells, since you can think of a solid sphere as made up of concentric cells. And here the gravitational force exerted by a solid sphere can be thought of as being exerted by a point mass located at the center of the sphere. Here I'll look at a case where the point is inside the sphere. Now the integral goes from big R minus R to big R plus R. Again, I'll move minus gm over 4 r r squared outside the integral. And then I then, then determine the antiderivatives like I did before. If I evaluate that over the range big R minus r and big R plus r, I get this equation. I'll expand the r squared minus big R squared again, term again. And I don't have common terms in the numerator and denominator. In the first term, I need to change the order of r minus big R. I can do that by changing the minus sign that precedes it. Once I make those cancellations, I end up with this. And that ends up being 2r minus 2r, which is 0. This whole thing ends up equaling 0. So if you're inside a hollow sphere of mass m, you will feel no gravitational force. The mass all around you cancels out. And that's true no matter where you are inside the sphere. You don't need to be in the geometric center. I proved mathematically that a uniformly distributed spherical mass exerts a gravitational force as if it were a point mass located at its center. The equation, um, if the test mass is outside the sphere, is the case where little r is greater than big R. The formula is minus g times m over r squared times the unit vector r. The equation of the test mass is inside a spherical shell is the case where little r is less than big R. And there the force equals 0. I proved this mathematically. Um, here, I want to prove it geometrically. Here, I'll arrange a number of uh, mass points within a spherically symmetrical mass. This is a two-dimensional representation, so imagine it was in three dimensions. The force from an individual off-center point is stronger on one side and weaker on the other. In this diagram, the left is stronger, the right is weaker. The field lines are more dense on the left and less dense on the right. Here I'll take a corresponding mass on the right side as gravitational force is stronger on the right and weaker on the left. And if I put both mass points together, you'll see that um, the field vectors uh, add up. The horizontal vectors simply reinforce each other. The, the vertical vectors average to one single vector in the middle. The di diagonal vectors also average out. And if I put all the points together, you'd add all the field vectors and the superposition of all of them results in vectors that originate from the center of the sphere. So hence, if you compress the mass, um, the number of lines of force that intersects the shell of the sphere remains the same. Newton had a geometric proof that while it demonstrates the gravitational law, I think has some flaws. So here I'll start with a spherical shell of uniformly distributed mass. I'll put a small mass um, 
P of magnitude M inside a sphere. Caroline P along the center line, but put it off center. Now I'll construct a double cone with apex at P as shown in the diagram. The cones form this angle theta here. A1 and A2 are caps formed at the end of the cones where they intersect the sphere. They end up being circular because P is on the center line, and I'll talk about a more general case later. The base of A1 is a distance of R1 from P. The base of A2 is a distance of R2 from P. And the height of the caps are H1 for A1 and H2 for A2. Here I'll call the mass density P and the thickness of the caps T. The mass of the first area is M1, and it equals the density P times the surface area, A1 times the thickness T. I use a similar equation for the mass of area A2. Newton, in one of his derivations, used the area for a disk as an approximation for the area of the caps A1 and A2. And he argued that the disk could be made to be infinitesimally small, and through integration could be used to determine the exact area of the cap. He'd already developed a proof like that for the shell theorem. So approximating caps with disks um, might have some flaws, but when you get to an infinitesimal level, it probably works. The area of the disk is 2 pi r squared. I can substitute the formula for area into the mass equations. And here are the formulas for the net force on P. The first term is the force caused by A1 on P. And the second term is the force caused by A2 on P. One is subtracted from the other because the forces counteract. Here I'll substitute in the formulas for M1 and M2, and notice that for each of the terms, there's an R squared in the numerator and an R squared in the denominator, which will cancel. And that results in this formula. Each of these terms is the same constant, and I've proven that the force caused by A1 is identical to the force caused by A2. The area of A2 is bigger, so intuitively you would think it would result in a larger gravitational force, but it's farther away from P. The 1 over R squared law says that even though it's bigger, its gravitational forces diminish because of the greater distance. The area A1 is closer to P, so intuitively you think that it would result in a larger gravitational force, but it has less mass. The two effects, A2 being larger but farther away and A1 being closer but smaller, cancel out exactly. The net force on P is zero. Works out nicely, but here's a slight flaw with this method. The formula for a spherical cap is 2 pi r h, where h is the height of the cap. The radius in the formula is the radius of a sphere, which is not equal to r1 and r2. The proper areas are 2 pi r h1 for a1 and 2 pi r h2 for a2. I ultimately want to get to a formula where r1 squared and r2 squared terms cancel out. They'd have to show up in the numerator, and I'd have to go through a lot of algebra and trig to derive proper formulas for m1 and m2. It gets even worse. What I really want is for P to be at any arbitrary location. Here the cones intersect in two areas of the sphere that are closest to us. I've depicted the intersections in ellipses, but they aren't actually ellipses. The shapes formed by the intersection of the two cones are, and a sphere are irregular. So I could derive formulas for the shapes, and um, they're kind of like areas for the caps, but it would involve a lot of messy calculations. So I already did a simple integration that proved that a spherically uniform distributed mass is identical to a point mass for the gravitational force. These geometric proofs that make use of cones, disks, and ellipses projected on a sphere are not totally correct um, and could give you the wrong intuition, although the answer is right. Imagine a tunnel that goes completely through the Earth, passing through the center, and assume the Earth is a uniformly dense sphere which is a wrong assumption, but um, assume that to be the case. What's the gravitational force inside the tunnel? I've shown you that if you're at the exact center, the gravi net gravitational force is zero. The entire Earth would act like a big shell around you. What are the effects as you go from the surface deeper? Out here, at a distance r from the center of the Earth, the force is due to the amount of matter within the sphere of the Earth. For this point outside the sphere of the Earth, the gravitational force is minus g, times the mass of the Earth, m, times the mass of this test mass, little m, over the distance from the center, r squared. If I plot that, it looks like this. The x-axis is the distance from the center of the Earth. The y-axis is the gravitational force. The force diminishes exponentially as the test mass moves farther from the Earth. If I put a test mass, p, here, inside the Earth, but not all the way in, some of the Earth's mass exerts the force on the test mass, and some doesn't. Here is a spherical radius of P to the center of the Earth. 
The mass outside this radius is a spherical shell, thus it has no gravitational effect on P. Only the mass inside the radius has a gravitational effect. Here I'll call the mass inside M sub P, and here I'll call P the mass density. The formula for the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. M sub P is then P times 4 thirds pi r cubed. The gravitational force exerted on P is minus G times P times 4 thirds pi r cubed over r squared. That simplifies to G P 4 thirds pi r. The gravitational force on P inside the tunnel is a linear relationship where F is a function of the radius r. That means as you penetrate deeper into the earth, the force of gravity decreases linearly. The mass inside the radius r exerts a force at 1 over r squared, but the amount of mass in the sphere um, decreases by r cubed. Um, r cubed over r squared is r, hence the linear relationship uh, to r. And here's what that part of the plot looks like. The plot below the radius of the Earth diminishes linearly. The part above the radius of the Earth diminishes exponentially. I mentioned that when Newton discovered his law of gravitation, he unified the force that caused an apple to drop from a tree with the force that kept the moon in its orbit around the Earth. Here I want to determine how far the moon falls in one second. I currently know it to be 376,802 kilometers away from the Earth. The mass of the moon is 7.3477 times 10 to the 22nd kilogram. Although for what I'm going to do here, I don't need the mass of the moon. The distance from the Earth to the moon is 3.844 times 10 to the 8th um, meters on average. The moon has an apogee and a perigee, and I'm going to ignore that for the moment and assume a circular orbit. The distance from the center of the Earth to the moon is r sub e plus h. That equals 3.8371 times 10 to the 8th. And here, the radius of the Earth is small compared to the distance to the moon. The equation for the gravitational force is g times m, uh, the mass of the moon, times m sub e, the mass of the Earth, over r sub e plus h, the distance to the moon squared. Here's that equation with all the values filled in. And here I've added the total distance in the denominator from the center of the Earth to the moon. That's 3.8371 times 10 to the 8th uh, meters. And like before, I'll put g in the denominator. Um, the denominator becomes 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 27th, and that equals 2.71 times 10 to the minus 3. The acceleration the moon experiences that is caused by the Earth is 2.71 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second. And here's the formula for position. The distance the moon falls in one second is y of 1. That equals 1 half times 2.71 times 10 to the minus third times 1 squared. That's 0 0.001357 meters or 0 0.14 centimeters. And here I'll check this against the actual orbital motion of the moon. Imagine this is the moon's orbit around the Earth. The actual orbit would be much bigger. And here I'll say this is how far the moon would travel in a second. And here I'll set up a right triangle. In one second, the moon travels theta radians. The period of the moon is 27.32158 days, which equates to 2.36 times 10 to the 6 seconds. Theta equals 2 pi times 1 second over the total period of the orbit. That equals 6.283 divided by 2.36 times 10 to the 6, which equals 2.66 times 10 to the minus 6. The cosine of theta is the adjacent over hypotenuse. That's r sub e plus h over r sub e plus h plus s. I want to solve for s. First, r sub e plus h plus s equals r sub e plus h over cosine theta. S equals r sub e plus h over cosine theta minus r sub e plus h. And if I substitute in values, I get this, and that equals 0 0.001357, or 0 0.14 centimeters, which I derived from Newton's law. The main takeaway from this section is that you can consider spheres of uniform density as point masses in gravitation equations. And the other takeaway is the method that um, I showed you 
for deriving that mathematically uh, using integral calculus.